You're listening to the St. John's Dumb and Creek podcast. This episode presented by Senior Minister Tim Johnson. I'm Joe, and we're bringing you today's Bible reading, which is from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 2 to 10. Sorry, chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. Yeah. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected, has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, so that you may declare the praises of him who caught Hold you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not the people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thanks be to God. Well, we're living in a changed world. In Melbourne, where we've got stage three restrictions, there are things that we can't do, like going to the footy, and there are things that we have to do, like wearing masks, though we're allowed to take them off when we're preaching. Lost my glasses too. (laughs) And even when the restrictions are lifted, uh, the world that we're going back into will still be a changed world where much will be different. Uh, People are talking about the fact that we'll need to find a new normal. And so this series that we're speaking on at the moment here is called Back to a New Future. We're thinking about, well, what will the future hold for us in the world? And we want to be people who are thinking proactively about that. As Christian people, we want to be thinking about what God has to say about the best way to live, to align ourselves with God's norms as we find a new normal that is matched up with what God would call us to do. And today we're thinking about what that means for the church. What will the church look like in this change world that we're moving into? There's been no doubt that over the last four months, the changes experienced by the church worldwide have been some of the biggest uh, that the church has experienced in in 2,000 years of existence. A year ago, who would have predicted that churches wouldn't be gathering for their Easter services all around the world? And honestly, the likelihood of us being able to do our usual Christmas services this year seems very unlikely. It's hard to imagine 400 people crammed into this church building singing carols boisterously. And there's a, there's a grief in that. I feel it. I've had times on Sunday morning sitting watching the live stream at home where, frankly, I just feel like bursting into tears. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it's great to have this live stream, uh, this recording capacity where we can continue to gather together, to have that sense of being together. But there's still a grief in it. I grieve the fact that I'm not with you uh, today. 
I grieve the fact that we can't be together because I love you and I want to be with you. We're a family, we're a community together. The word translated in the New Testament for church is the word ecclesia, which literally means gathering. So how can we be the church, the gathering, when we cannot gather? It comes down to a question of identity, doesn't it? Who are we at our core as the church? Because that's the thing that has to shape us as we think about the future. What are the things that must remain? What are the things that cannot change? What are the things that are absolutely core to our identity? And then with that in mind, how do we move forward from that into a changed world with new possibilities of ways that we can live out being the church? This is actually a question that goes beyond our current pandemic and its restrictions. This is a question really that the church always has to ask as we live in a world which is constantly changing, sometimes in uh, smaller ways than in others, but we have to continually think about how we can stay true to being the church and yet finding new ways to do it and to connect with people in a world that is changing. So that's the question that we're going to think about today as we look at this passage from 1 Peter chapter 2. And this passage really is an encouragement to us as we are reminded of our identity. And it also, I hope, is a challenge to us as we think about living out that new identity in a world that has changed. So the first thing that needs to be said about the church from this passage is that Jesus is at the centre. So uh, verse 4 uh, describes Jesus as a living stone who is the cornerstone of the church. Uh, Jesus is a living stone because he has risen from the dead. He's alive He's active, he's present in the world today and in the church. And he's the cornerstone, that's sort of the key image here of Jesus as the cornerstone of a building, which is the church. That is, he gives shape and direction to the building and the entire structure is built upon him and would collapse if he wasn't there. It's a powerful reminder for us that the church only exists because of Jesus and for Jesus. If there is no Jesus, then there is no church. And if the church abandons Jesus, downplays his significance, forgets him or ignores him, then the church ceases to be the church. He is that central and that important. So we as a church here at St John's want Jesus to be the cornerstone of all that we do. And so our mission states this. Our mission is know Jesus, make Jesus known. That is, we want to be in relationship with Jesus. We want to know him and deepen our knowledge of him, not just in an intellectual sense, but personally and relationally. And we don't want to just hold Jesus to ourselves. We want to make Jesus known so that other people can have that relationship with him too. And our vision as a church is to be an intergenerational community which is loving like Jesus, growing in Jesus, and sharing Jesus. Wow, that's a lot of Jesus. Isn't that a bit too much Jesus in that mission statement? No. No because the church exists because of Jesus and exists for Jesus. He is the cornerstone. He shapes everything that we do. Everything must be built upon him, and without him, the whole thing crumbles to the ground. So we want to name that and not be embarrassed about it. Now, because Jesus is the cornerstone of the church, that means that you can't be part of the church without Jesus and you can't have Jesus without having the church as well. 
Do you notice in this passage how often it talks about responding to Jesus? So in verse 4, it talks about, it says, as you come to him. In verse 6, it says, the one who trusts in him. Verse 7 speaks about believing in him. They're all parallel expressions. We need to believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is God himself come amongst us in human flesh. We need to be willing to to trust him, to so believe the things that he says that we entrust our lives to him. And we need to come to him, that is, we need to be willing to follow after him with everything that we have to make him the leader of all of our life. It's a big call, but it's one that can't be avoided. In the language of this passage, Jesus is like this this huge stone that's been dropped into the path of history. And you can't avoid him and you can't go around him. To ignore him or to reject him is to trip, to trip over because he is the one that God has placed in history as the one that we do need to respond to. Plenty of people do ignore Jesus and reject him, but to do that is actually to ignore God's interaction with us, God's way that we can be saved from our failings and our sin and God's way that we can be in relationship with him, the creator God, the one who has made us. Jesus is the centre of God's plans, the centre of God's purposes in history and for each of our lives and it calls for a response. The alternative other than ignoring and rejecting him and so tripping over is to believe him, to trust him, to come to him. Recognise him that he is the cornerstone and being built into his church. Here's an image for you if you are a follower of Jesus. You're a brick. Now, by that I don't mean you're solid, you're really reliable, uh, although you might be. Uh, And please, I'm not saying you're thick as a brick. Don't hear me saying that. No, you're a brick in the sense that you're made to be part of something. Now, a a brick in and of itself isn't that useful. You you can't do much with a brick. You could sort of do some weights, um, break a window. Uh, There's not that much you can do with a brick. They're pretty boring, really. But when you put them together with other bricks, you can do incredible things. You can build all sorts of structures all sorts of things. They're incredibly useful. And so as Christians, we're bricks in the sense that we're meant to be built together with other bricks, other followers of Jesus. Verse 4 says, As you come to him, the living stone, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. When you come to Jesus you are automatically and inescapably part of the church. You see, if I come to Jesus and you come to Jesus, then guess what? We're together with Jesus. Or as the Bible often puts it even more powerfully, we are in Jesus together. We're that united. Now, we live in a fairly individualistic culture, Uh, We tend to think primarily of ourselves as individuals rather than part of groups. And we live in a culture also which treats religion as an individual belief system. Like, it's okay what you believe, um, but keep it private. Don't speak about it publicly um, at polite dinner parties. Don't don't bring up your, your faith or your religion. And so we tend to think in quite individualistic terms. But the truth is that you cannot have Jesus without having the church thrown in too. I'm sorry about that, if that's a disappointment to you. 
When you unite with Jesus, you automatically unite with other followers of Jesus. The identity of the church in this this corporate and collective sense is spelled out in really beautiful terms in verse 9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. These four descriptions are all corporate. Do you notice that? You, plural, we might say use, yous are a chosen people. We become part of a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multinational race of people who are believers and followers of Jesus. You, plural, are a royal priesthood. Together we offer spiritual sacrifices to God, which is speaking about our whole lives dedicated to God's service, the way that we do school, the way that we work, the way that we speak, we think, we act, the way that we relate to our family and our friends are all part of our worship of God, our sacrifice to God in a spiritual sense. As our lives are transformed by God's Holy Spirit and we live more in accordance with the way that God wants us to live, we're offering sacrifices to God by living His way. You are a holy nation. Uh, We balk at the word holy because we think of things like holier than thou and um, we think of people who who try and think that they're better than other people and judge them, you know, by some standard that other people don't live up to. But if you want to know what holiness looks like, look at the person of Jesus. Jesus is the most holy person ever to have lived and people were so attracted to him. He was so earthy and real He related well to people. And it's speaking about that, being a holy nation, living holy lives is about reflecting the truth and the beauty of Jesus, living with integrity under God's good and loving rule. You, plural, are God's special possession. You're loved by God. You're precious to God. He holds you in his hands. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know in the midst of a world which is changing, where there's uncertainty, where there's fear and anxiety, that we are God's special possession, that he holds us and he loves us and we're in his care. All of these things are not things that we do on our own. They are corporate. They are things that we do together. What this means is that church is not primarily something that you go to, It's something that we are. It's not primarily a a, a worship service we attend. It's not primarily a, a building that we might gather in. It is a group of people who follow Jesus together. Now, because we are united in Jesus, that means that we we do want to gather together and we should gather together. We should express the reality of who we are as united together in Jesus in concrete and real ways by gathering together as we're able to do. But we go to church because we are the church. It's about putting our identity into practice. What it also means is just because we can't meet in person at the moment doesn't mean that we cease being the church. We still are the church, that's the reality of our identity, and so we just have to get more creative about how we are the church together, how we encourage and support each other, how we are taught from God's word together, how we share the good news of Jesus together with other people, and we're free to be creative and to use new media to do that. It's a way of living out our identity. Uh, If you're someone who is a follower of Jesus, but you're not actively connected with a church community somewhere, can I encourage you to think about how you might do that more fully? Because it's about living out that identity in real ways, connecting with these other followers of Jesus that you're already united with in a real sense and living that out more fully. We'd love to help you with that. 
you'd be welcome to join more fully in with what we're doing as a church in the sort of ways that Julie was describing at the beginning. Connect with us through our website. Um, we'd love to join you up with a, with a life group that are all meeting via Zoom um, at the moment. Um, or if you're living somewhere around the world or around Australia, we could help you connect up with other people locally to where you are. Uh, we'd love to help you and do our best to help you with that. The last part of verse 9 speaks of the purpose of the church. You know, it's, it's wonderful to have this identity that we're loved by God, that we're a chosen people, a, a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation, God's special possession. But the idea is not for us to just sit and to bask in the, the warmth of God's love and privilege. He wants us to do something about it. Verse 9 goes on to say, to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. If, if you praise someone, then you're saying how good they are or how good the things they have done are. And so we do that about God. We declare God's praises directly to him as we uh, sing, as we pray, um, as we speak to God in prayer. We, we tell him that we think he's incredible and we praise him for what he's done in our lives. But it's also something that we do uh, publicly. We, we praise God before other people. We tell other people, you know, God is great and he's done some incredible things in our lives. Um, so praising God, declaring God's praises is, is both worship, but it's also witness as we praise God in different ways. So what's the purpose of the church pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID? Well, it's to declare the praises of God, to speak up about the one who has brought us out of darkness into light, to speak up about the one who has shown us mercy and forgiveness uh, and made us part of something incredible, which is the church, uniting us together with people all over the world. The world might change and is changing, but that purpose is changeless. It flows out of our identity as the church, centred and built together on Jesus Christ. So I've tried to focus today on the core for us as a church. What is our core identity and what is our core purpose? Uh, and as we think about a new future, as we think about trying to find a new normal, we can do it with great confidence from this core identity that we have in Jesus Christ. There are things that are off limits that simply don't match up with that identity, that would be out of step with being the church. But there's also, isn't there, a broad scope of freedom. From that core identity, there are, there's permission for how we act out being the church, how we put it into practice, how we live it out in reality together. Uh, which brings us back to these buckets that we've been using over the last few weeks. As we think about uh, moving into a new future, we want to think about what are some of the things that we've stopped doing that we don't want to go back to? What are some new things that we might have started over these months that we would like to continue? What are some things that have changed that we'd really like to adopt as a normal part of life? And then what are some of the things that we've been doing out of necessity uh, that we want to drop as soon as we're able to? Uh, and we need to think about these things as a church. How does the church moving into the new future think through these buckets? Now, it's a big question. We've been thinking a bit about that as a staff this week, but that's really start of the start of the conversation we need our leadership teams within the church to be thinking about this and doing it well. But here's a few things that we could think about. I'm just going to drop a few examples into these buckets to help us think, and I'm going to do it in reverse order. What are the, some of the things that we're doing out of necessity that we want to drop as soon as possible? Well, 
let's put the mask in there. <laughs> I want to get rid of that as soon as we're able safely to do so. Um, but I was thinking things like remote communion. Uh, it's been great to have bread and juice or wine in our own homes, um, to be able to remember Jesus together. But it's not the same, is it, as the family meal where we're gathered together, where we break bread and look into each other's eyes and have that sense of being together, united in Jesus, as we share the meal of remembrance that he's given us. So that's something that, you know, out of necessity, we've had to do it remotely. But when we're able to, we want to be bringing back that in person. What have we changed that we might want to continue? Well, you know, offering digital church is one thing. So many of you have said, this has been great having this available for people who are sick or shut into their homes, or it's been great to share it with different people around the world. Please keep doing this even when we're able to gather in person. And I think that's right. I think digital church is one of those things that we want to continue. But we need to be honest about the reality of what it takes to put it on each week. It's essentially like adding a whole new extra service to do it well. And so we need to balance that out with what resources is that going to take so that we're not just burning out volunteers and staff? How do we create space with other things to make sure that we can keep doing that when we're able to meet in person as well? What have we started doing that we might want to continue doing? Well, having some meetings online has been good. Obviously, we wouldn't want to do all of those. I know there's life groups who are dead keen to get back together in person and want to drop the online meeting. For some people, it might be the necessity bucket. But for others, they've realised that the flexibility that it gives works really well for them. For people who can't easily get out at night because they're caring for children or People who might take advantage of being in a life group from work in their lunch break can just jump online and do it. That's been really positive. Doing alpha online has been great because people can join in all over the world. So some form of online meetings we think might want to continue. What about what's stopped that we don't want to go back to? Do you know, this is, this is always the hardest bucket to do. For the same reasons that Kirk was speaking about last week, where in our own lives, it's, it's harder to stop doing things, to cut back the activities in our own life. We tend to get busier and busier. It's not just true for us as individuals, but it's also true for organisations. And the church uh, is just like that. The church is very good at adding in more and more and getting busier and busier. And there's a danger of burning people out. So this is a, an important bucket. If we're going to add in extra things, we need to make sure that we are stopping some other things and creating space and even stopping things that might be good in and of themselves but need to create space to do some of these other things which might be better as we move into a changed world. So we're going to have to think very carefully about the things that need to stop and change. Uh, so what are we going to put in here? Well, here's, here's one thing that we were talking about as a staff. Too many meetings. Uh, and travelling all the time to meetings. Sometimes there's meetings that would be easier to do in different ways rather than travelling to them. And we've all heard of uh, the meeting that should have just been an email. So um, some of the time we've been less busy in terms of meetings and other things, and that's something that we want to try and maintain and think carefully about how we do that. So there's just a couple of ideas. But what do you reckon? As we, the church, together move into a new future? What are some of the ways that we will need to change and adapt without undermining our core identity, without undermining our values, without undermining our, our purpose to declare God's praises wherever we go and whatever we do, and making sure that Jesus is the centre? Within that, what are the possibilities? What are the creative ideas that you have in your mind? What are some of the things that we've stopped that should stay stopped? What does the new future look like for us as the church? Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for St. John's Diamond Creek. 